Welcome to Life After Fame Podcast. Just imagine 70,000 fans cheering your name when you've scored the winning touchdown. Imagine standing on stage looking out at the crowd, rocking out to that chart-busting song you created. The applause and recognition you received for your masterful acting performance in that latest blockbuster movie. And then, one day, the cheering stops. This podcast is all about catching up with these stars of yesterday to find out where they're at now and who they are as people beyond the stardom. This is a true human interest podcast about the people we loved to root for. And now your hosts, Joe Mastriona and Joe Boglino. Imagine making the NFL and not playing one down of college football. Imagine being invited to the NFL Pro Day and running a 4.2340 and being asked to run it again because the scouts thought your performance had to do more with your shoes than your ability. Then putting on some old Chuck Taylors and running that same 40 in 4.33. Wade Manning has always been an athlete. He took the road less traveled to the NFL. He made it based on his athleticism, not his draft position. Wade shares a story about his time in the NFL, how he made the league, stories that shed light on the ugly side of the business, the misconception about player money, and what it was like to play for legendary NFL Hall of Fame coach Tom Landry, and the talk he had with Landry that ended his time in Dallas. It was not as glamorous as you might think. This week, we welcome seven-year pro and 30-year educator, Wade Manning, to Life After Fame. Welcome to Life After Fame, Mr. Wade Manning. Thank you for joining us today, sir. Uh, Thank you for having me on the show. We want to start out, Wade. I want to read you an old sports adage. Get your thoughts on how it relates to you and other players you've been around. And the adage is, they say every pro athlete dies twice, once for real, and once when they're forced to stop playing their sport. Wait, does that it does it feel true to you that a certain amount of your identity dies when you retire as a player? For me personally, I don't believe that happened. And just real quick, I don't believe that it happened because emotionally, I was never a football player. I was an athlete playing football. So because I didn't play high school or college football, and I didn't play Little League and junior high, I didn't have that I'm a football player thing. I was an athlete. God blessed me with some speed and strength and talent and quickness, and I was an athlete playing football. And because I was a free agent, also, I didn't think that I was the greatest thing since sliced bread. I was just happy that I got an opportunity to do what I always wanted to do when I was a child, which was be a professional athlete. But I do understand this dying twice thing because it ends suddenly. There's no kind of cruise into the end of it and then you retire and you go on with life it just abruptly ends whether you choose to quit or whether you get cut i didn't have the opportunity of just cruising to quit i got cut my last my eighth training camp i got cut and then i was ready for it because i always thought i was gonna get cut Every day and every play was my last play because I was a free agent. They're just waiting on you to make a mistake. At least it seemed like that. So they could cut you and move on. They were always waiting for you to fail. And I starved them off for seven years in a row. Like, it doesn't matter who you draft and put in my position. They're not going to be able to outrun me, outlift me, outcatch me. I'm not going to make mistakes because that'll get me cut. But when it ended, is, huh? What do I do now? I was ready for the what I do now because I, I substitute taught every off season for seven years in a row. 
I even substituted during the 82 strike for seven weeks in a row. And I knew that I could just transition from football right into my college degree, which was education, and just go on with life. I didn't try to go to Canada. I didn't try to play in any other league. Once it was done, I was 30 years old, and I felt like it was important for me to start my second career, which was going to be teaching. And I did, and I did it for 30 years in a row and then retired in 2019. But I saw lots of guys who were not ready for the game team. And so, it in probably 2000, was, so in 2019, you retired from your second profession. Any easier, any different than it was the first time you, you left your first profession? Yeah, it was real easy. One, from a financial standpoint, if you work more than 30 years, at least in the state of Colorado, if you work more than 30 years as a teacher, your retirement income is not going to get any bigger. You are now working for the state of Colorado or for the joy of teaching. I kind of lost the joy of teaching because in the educational system, it got to the point where you couldn't really teach anymore. It was just too much discipline going on because kids didn't know how to behave. And I didn't want to be in front of a class for 90 minutes. We were on what they call the block system, and it was 90-minute classes. And if you look at the statistics of attention span, is only 23 minutes. You got almost an hour to go, and you got kids in your classroom misbehaving. So I believe, because of the type of teacher I was, if you guys had any opportunity to talk to any of my former students, they would think that I was Richard Pryor. Because I had to entertain mm. them. I mm. was teaching their attention. <coughs> and I literally retired. And if the principal hears this podcast, he'll hear it for the second time. The reason why I retired, <laughs> the principal came into a teacher's meeting and said, we could no longer give a student a zero for cutting our class. We had to give them 50%. The rationale was if a kid gets a zero on a grading scale of 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 percent, that the student could never recover from that zero. My position was he should have came to class then. I didn't like the fact that they were setting kids up to think that they didn't have to work and they could still pass their classes. Let me ask you a question here. You've got an interesting profile, Wade. The fact of the matter is that what you accomplished was an anomaly. Only a handful of guys in the history of the NFL didn't follow a blueprint. The blueprint that us, you know, general Joes know is that you play one sport, your parents focus you on one sport, everything is a one sport deal. You go to high school, you play, then you go into college and you do what you can to get noticed and then go into the NFL. The blueprint is the blueprint until someone achieves the same thing without it and then all the blueprints are thrown out the door. But what dawned on me here is doing research on you here is you didn't play football in college. And I think it was very sparingly in high school. You went to a pro day. You had a very impressive pro day because you ran a 440 like lightning. And they didn't believe you. They thought it had to do with your shoes. But here's the question. Do you think <laughs> that not following the blueprint cost you a more stability in your career? Because they may have drafted a guy in the fourth round. He may not even had near the speed or the talent that you had, but maybe he got consideration because he was drafted and followed the blueprint. But yet you were invited as a free agent to the Dallas Cowboys. And one of your first instances on the field was go out there and I think it was a kick return and you ran it back four yards. Almost every single time you hit the field, I found that you rose to the occasion and you excelled. Even your first game against Pittsburgh, you had a very solid game. But yet you were a free agent who didn't follow the blueprint. Do you ever look back on that and go, okay, I was an athlete. But if I would have done it differently, maybe I could have had 
a different career. And long story short, how I even got invited to the NFL training day. They didn't have pro days yet or the combine. I ran two punts in practice as a student teacher at Dublin High School. And the coach said, wait, we want the punt team to do a pursuit drill with you. Just go back 40 yards. We're going to kick you the ball. And we want you to run around until all 11 guys touch you. I did that twice. And both times I ran the length of the field for a touchdown and nobody was even close to touch. No one touched you. (laughs) And it was easy. At least I thought it was. I was a world-class sprinter. I was a center fielder in baseball, so I can't miss the moon if you kick it to me. Well, I caught the ball. I ran to my left and let everybody angle to the left. Then I reversed field and ran the length of the field for a touchdown. It just seemed it was a chase game for me. If they didn't stay in their lanes and run straight downfield and create this picket fit, you're not going to outrun me. So I did it again. I ran to the right, and they all angled to the right. And I reversed field and ran down the left sideline for a touchdown. Well, the coach called Dick Walker at Pittsburgh, unbeknownst to me, and said, look, do you know who Wade Manning is? I called Dick and I asked him if he remembered you back then. And he said, oh, yeah, we know who Wade is, but we couldn't let him come out and try out for football because it would have made us look like we didn't know how to scout. And he's even now, wow. the Pittsburgh hmm. was will not him because he has no previous football experience. He says, but I know a team that will. And it was the Seattle Seahawks. They were in their third year in the league and they were trying to pattern their scouting department like the Dallas Cowboys looking for college athletes versus just football players. Went to the pro day on January 28th, 1979. All 28 teams had a scout there to time the athletes. And Mel Renfro from the Dallas Cowboys was the scout for the Cowboys. I ran a 4-2-3 in the 40, and 4-2-5, 4-2-7, 4-2-9. They thought maybe I had on track spikes. I didn't. I had on that waffle bottom turf shoe. And they measured it to make sure it was 40 yards because I was the last person to run. And then they asked me if I had any other shoes I could wear, and I put on my high top Chuck Taylor canvas converse, and I ran a 4-3-3. Mel Renfro went back to Dallas and told them, hey, there's this kid at Ohio State. He's 196 pounds. He's very athletic. He's running world-class times. We need to take a look at him. So two days later, Mel Renfro and John Wooten, who was a guard for the Cleveland Browns when Jim Brown was the running back, he was a scout for Dallas also, and they – came and they said, look, you don't have to run any more 40s, but we got to see if you can move. So they took me to a Jewish community center in Lyndhurst, Ohio, on a basketball court, and they had me backpedal 20 yards. They had me do these agility drills with these three lights. Had a light in the middle and one on each side, and whichever one lit up when I was backpedaling, I had to either run straight ahead if it was the middle light, go left or right if it was the appropriate light. So they were measuring my reaction time and quickness. They said they had never climbed anybody in the 20 yards backwards like that. And they wanted to know how I could run backwards so fast without falling. And I said, baseball. We backpedal in baseball all the time on fly balls, especially to find the warning track. And then you got about eight more feet before that fence. And you ain't trying to kill yourself going into the fence. But anyway, the Seattle Seahawks, the scout that invited me was a guy named Ralph Goldston. And again, I found out a year ago that Ralph was a coach at the University of Colorado before he became a scout for Seattle. And one of the Bronco former players who I'm a friend with here, Glenn Bailey, said, hey, man, Ralph was my coach when I was at CU. And I said, he was the one that invited me to the NFL training day, and it led to me signing with the Dallas Cowboys. Dick Walker told me, Wade, if you had played college football, you would have been a number one draft pick in the National Football League. 
He said, people can't do what you do. They don't run like that. They don't stop and start like that. They don't change directions like that. And you can catch a football with left hand, right hand, behind your back. And that was all because of baseball. I used to catch fly balls behind my back in practice. I didn't have the nerve to do it in the game. They hit you fly balls and you would get up under it and then you'd catch it behind your back. I could do that with a punted football. It was harder to do it with a kickoff when the ball was tumbling, but you could do it with the spiral ball when it turned over and came down. So I could catch it with one hand above my head and either hand or behind my back. So the Cowboys were confident that this kid could learn to play football. But I was told, and after I got to Dallas, back to your one comment, Joe, about the shoes, when I got to Dallas, the strength coach, Dr. Bob Ward, he says, wait, those times at those pro days, training days, they don't count. Those are hand time. We're going to see if you can run. And I said, Coach Ward, if I can't do anything, I can run. We'll have to see if I can play football. So he set Please up the Please tell me you got your Chuck T's out. Please yeah. tell me you got your Chuck T's out, right? <laughs> Here, coach, I'll run them in the Chuck T's. <laughs> football shoes on, and I ran a, on the electronic timing that they use today at the Combine. They had a light beam at 10, 20, 30, and 40 yards, and we ran on grass, and it was not on the field. It was on the sideline of the field that sloped down towards Long John Silvers because we were – our practice field was – Literally 100 yards of grass. No bells and whistles like they have now. And so the field was arced for drainage. So I was running on an uneven surface with this electronic timing. And the grass was not cut that day either. I'm not exaggerating. I ran 4-3-3 on the electronic timing on grass with football shoes. And Coach Ward said, that is 4-2 all day long. And I say, yeah, coach, I ran a 419 twice for my college track coach. Yes, I had on spikes, and it was on the same surface that I ran at the training day. And he says, yeah, I believe it. And I, the slowest 40 I ever ran in my life was a 433. <laughs> so that is talk about all like you said, world class. Yeah. Carol Green not faster than me. Herschel Walker, none of those guys were faster than me in the 40. Maybe in 100, I don't know. Maybe in the 200, but not 40 yards. So, Wade, you are an, obviously an exceptional athlete. That is world-class speed. That guys aren't running that normally. And I think you held that that record, too, for... I don't know, 20, 30 years, didn't you? Until John Ross, maybe, of the Cincinnati Bengals ran just slightly. Yeah. Yeah, John yeah. ran a 4-2 at the Combine. Yeah. I ran a 4-2-3. Yeah. They weren't going to count 4-1. Yeah. But, right. and he ran electronic timing, which was pretty amazing. Yeah, so... With that, I have to ask, was there any regrets, if you look back, not choosing baseball over football? Because you were one hell of a baseball player at Ohio State. You, obviously, we know how fast you were. You could steal bases. In fact, you held the record for most stolen bases, I think, in a season. And yeah. you could hit it for power, too. And you were just a fast guy that was just maybe a, I don't know what, what number uh, in the batting order did you hit? Were you a lead off because of the speed or did they stick in a two, three hole because you had power? Yeah. I played baseball at Ohio state for three seasons and the first two, they had me at the lead off spot, but because I was okay. hitting some runs by my senior year, they put me at the third spot. I was going to say, yeah. they're going to stick you in the three hole because, yeah, you can hit for power. And even though you're running, at that, you're a one with your speed. You're, you want the, that player at the top of the lineup. 
However, yeah. most of the time when it's hot, when you're at the top of the lineup, you don't hit for power. You're you're running out ground balls and those types of things. But do you ever regret not choosing baseball because you were drafted by the Pirates, I believe, and then the Indians and the Yankees offered you spots on their team. By the time I got to Ohio State, my senior year came around. Actually, it was my junior year when I got drafted by the Pirates. My high school played in the state championship for baseball at Columbus on our field. And it was the first time that my coach, Dick Finn, met my high school coach, Fred Heinlein. And Fred said to Coach Finn, oh, my God, I wish I had him when he was this size because he was just a little guy in high school. And you got him, and he's six feet, 190 pounds, and runs like a deer. He said, Wade had an eye injury when he was in high school, which I think held him back a little bit. Well, Coach Finn used that conversation with Coach Highland with the Pirates. He didn't want me to sign and leave because he knew he couldn't compete for the Big Ten Championship without me. So even though the Pirates drafted me, when the Pirates spoke with him, he told them, I think Wade cannot play Major League Baseball because he had a serious eye injury when he was in high school. So the first thing the Pirates did is they took me to the University of Pittsburgh because I had to go to Pittsburgh to work out with the big team. It was a thrill because they still had Willie Stargell, Dave Parker, Al mm-hmm. Oliver. Frank Tanana, they had, all, and they those, had the and those family. cool uniforms. Yeah, yeah, yeah our family, the coolest man. uniforms. Mm-hmm. I love those. The pinstripe mm-hmm. stripes around the hat. Yeah, I loved it. So they took me to the University of Pittsburgh, and I had to do this eye exam before they would ever let me go and take batting practice and all of that. So I'm taking the eye exam. Now I learned how to fake through eye exams. From sophomore year when I hurt this eye all the way through to this moment. Mm. So I go and the doctor stops the exam in the middle of the exam. He gets up, he turns the lights on, and he goes, wait, there's nothing wrong with your eyes. And I said, well, who said there was something wrong with my eye? Your college coach said that we would be taking a chance on you because you had a serious eye condition when you were in high school and that you could not play pro ball. And I said to this doc, how could I lead the team in every offensive category, but I can't see? You, Yeah, there's no way you could hit the ball if you couldn't see. There's no way that is, yeah, BS. The pipe did me, I believe, because my senior year, the first game of the Big Ten was at Wisconsin. And we have a guy, and you can look him up, Paul Seymour. Paul had never won a game in the Big Ten, and this was his senior year. It was my junior year. And Paul came to me before that game, and he says, wait, I'm going to win today. I'm not going to lose another Big Ten game. You get me one run, and we'll win this game. I let off the game with a home run. Three and <laughs> half, two. I'm choking back because I don't want to strike out and I hit this ball 523 feet and the reason why I go is because it was 410 the center field and the soccer field was behind the center field fence when the ball landed on top of the soccer goal in the net so they measured from the fence to that net and it was 523 feet from home plate pirate scout was there that day and he felt like I fit right in with the lumber company. I didn't think that I would be able to hit major league pitching if my brother was struggling. Ah, maybe I better do this football thing. Training camp was about six weeks then. And I was like, hey, I'll know in six weeks. I'm either going to go make the team or I'll get cut. And if I get cut, I'll go ahead and start teaching in September of 79. I'll just start my teaching career and go on with life. I go to Dallas and. I have to give a lot of credit to the Dallas Cowboys, Gil Brandt for taking a chance on me, Mel Renfro, John Wooten, 
and then Tom Landry. And Tom Landry was so innovative and ahead of his time that when I went to Dallas in April of 79, because I signed as a free agent before the draft, Seattle wanted me to wait until after the draft, and the draft was in May then. I was like, I don't have time to get ready if I wait until the draft. So I signed in April. I went to Dallas in April. I signed February 2nd. And I went to Dallas in April for their off-season program. And they made me go to quarterback school with Roger Staubach, Danny White, and Glenn Carano, who was our third-string quarterback. And I had to learn offense. And I had to go out on the field in the afternoons and run the routes and learn how to do that multiple offense. And then when we were finished with that, a whole month later, then I had to go to defensive quarterback school with Thomas Hollywood Henderson, Bob Bruni, Dee Dee Lewis, Charlie Waters, and Cliff Harris to learn defense. And so I learned how to play. We didn't call it cover one, cover two, cover three, cover four. Then Landry had some crazy names, 31 safety zone, three man, eight man, 48 man. It was a lot of learning, but Landry gave me an opportunity to learn offense and defense. I had an inkling from Mike Ditka, who was our special teams coach. In the special teams meeting, Mike Ditka said, if you can run downfield, and he's talking to everybody, not just me. If you run downfield as fast as you can and hit something hard, you can play for me. Me being the fastest guy on the team, I was like, oh, I can do that. I can fly downfield and crash into something. I've been running into catchers with no equipment all my life. So I wasn't afraid because I had equipment. Oh, yeah, I could do that. And he said, we are looking for a punt returner that can replace Tony Hill. I was like, shoot, I can't miss the moon. I can catch these. So in practice, I'm catching these balls that no way a kicker can kick it that high. No way a punter can punt it that high. And I'm catching these things in front of me, behind my back, one hand, left hand. And Landry is looking at, what the, who is this guy? But he didn't let me run punts or kickoff until the third or fourth preseason game. I ran a punt in the Hall of Fame, but I hadn't run any punts in scrimmages or anything. And we got to the Hall of Fame game in Canton. And he goes, Manning, you're first up on punt return. And usually the special teams coach is the one to tell you that you first up. Landry said, Manning, you're first up on punt return. And I said, oh, shoot, he's trying to test me. It's Ray Guy. Okay, he's trying to test me. So I got about 50 yards from the line of scrimmage because I know Ray could boot it. And he kicked it 58. I caught it and returned it 42 yards and broke four tackles. I came back to the sideline, and Landry had this peculiar look on his face like, what just happened? He was supposed to lay down. He was supposed to miss the ball. He, and he just had this funny look on his face, and he nodded his head. And then he put me in the game to play DB, and I had to cover Cliff Branch in my first coverage. And I knew he was going to go deep because I'm a rookie, never played. He going deep. I backpedaled two, three strides, turn, and – Plunkett was throwing me the ball, and he overthrew me. Plunkett <laughs> overthrew me. So I didn't give up any catches that day, and I made a few tackles on running plays. And But then I didn't really play much more until we played Houston the next to the last preseason game, and I had a really good game on punt and kickoff. And then the last game of the year, the preseason, was against the Pittsburgh Steelers, and Landry called me into the – his office at the stadium that day and he says look I don't know how you're doing this but you're averaging 17.2 yards of punt return and 35 yards of return and you haven't even broke one yet he says show me something today that would overly convince me to keep you on this team and I said well coach, I've been given 100 percent I'll go out today I'll give 100 percent and we'll just see what happens so the second quarter came and he sent me out to run a punt. Hadn't run a punt that day or a kickoff. And he says, Manning, go out and run this punt. And it was like yesterday. Tony Dorsett grabbed me, 
by the collar of my shoulder pad. And Tony had broke his toe. So he was in that wooden walking boot thing. He said, wait, show him something. I looked at Tony. I said, Tony, I'm going to run this one back. And I go out. And uh, Craig Colquitt was the punter. Now, his son ended up kicking in Denver, and his other son ended up kicking in Kansas City. But he kicked me this ball, and the first guy downfield is as close as I am almost to my computer right now, and I made him miss. And I went down the Pittsburgh side, and because I have the film now, I never had it before, I have it now. I can send it to you if you want to see it. And uh, the linebacker, number 54, man, he came flying up on me. And I swear, I did a Barry Sanders dot and took off to my left. I just froze him and then took off to my left like I never stopped. And I saw Barry do that a lot. And I was like, whoa, look <laughs> like a little Barry Sanders right there. And I sweep across to our sideline and I'm running down my sideline and I got two white shirts that I see to my inside. It was Doug Cosby and another guy, number 82. I'll get his name, but and I'm like, okay, slow down and let these guys catch up and let them just shield you from the kicker and you can go on in for a touchdown. You see this film, Doug Cosby, number 84, looks like he doesn't know what to do. And he just gets in the way, just standing there, wobbling back and forth, looking. And uh, now I got to totally put the brakes on and see if I can wipe cold quit past me and get to the end zone. And he grabs the elbow pad on my arm. And I'm trying to get the arm out the pad. And here comes 82. And knocks me out of bounds. And I'm like pissed. I get 62 yards. And I come back to the sideline. And Landry just nodded his head. And I said, oh my God. I may have just made this team. And I did. And then opening day the next week. We're down. Well, we're up 19 to 16. And the, the, who was it? O.J. Anderson was a rookie with St. Louis. And he went 64 yards for a touchdown to put him up 21-19. And I go to Mike Ditka, and I go, Coach Ditka, can I and I go left on this kickoff return? And if you guys know anything about Mike's very high strung, and he was like, God damn it, Wade, we don't have an effing left return in. I said, Coach, I know, but can I go left? And he was like, why? And I said, because the guy <laughs> left side, which is their right side, he keeps trying to swing around the backside to make tackles from behind. So if he makes that turn, I can go that way. We can block it middle or right, but can I go left? Why was I asking? Because if you don't go where the play is designed to go, they'll cut you. They'll sit you down. They won't. If you're not going to go where we designed the play to go, you're not going to play. Right. So I couldn't take that right. hand. So I said, can I go left? He said, it better work. So I catch this ball, I start up the middle, and I take a hard jab step to the right. And that guy came around that left side, and boom, I cut left. All he could do was reach, and I slapped his hand down and went down our sideline for about 47, 48 yards and uh, got knocked out of bounds. And Landry came in, ran a couple of plays to keep the ball centered in the field. And sent Raphael Septian out there, and he kicked the field goal, and we won 22-21. to 21. <laughs> And I made Sweet. there of the week, the first game of the regular season. Got the big play award, all this accolades, except from Tom Landry. Hmm. We had the meeting the next day. We watched the game film. He gave an offensive game ball to Robert Newhouse. Robert had gained a hundred and some yards and scored a touchdown. Defensive player of the game was Aaron Kyle. He had had a couple interceptions. And he said no one played well enough on a special team to get a game ball. So Dang. I was like, okay. Interesting. Well, okay. The meeting ended and he's 
I had a note in my locker for me to come see him in his office at the practice field. So I went to see him in his office, and he says, Wade, I need to tell you why I didn't give you a game ball. He said, because there's no doubt that we don't win that game if you don't have that big play. He said, it was your first regular season game. That counted. And I didn't want you to get a big hit. And he asked me how I felt about it. And I said, Coach Landry, you don't want to know. Because I'm going to answer Joe's question about Coach Finn in a second here. I said, you don't want to know. And he said, oh, I do. I do want to know. And I said, the coach, I am giving you everything I got. I know I'm a free agent, and I'm just trying to fit in and help this team win some games. And I just think without that play, we don't win the game. And if I deserve a game ball, I deserve a game ball. And he says, my decision is my decision. And I was bold enough to say, then I don't know why you asked me how I felt about it. You said nobody played well enough. Maybe I can play well enough next week. I expect to play well every week to help this team win, not to just get a game ball. And the next week we went to San Francisco to play the 49ers and the punishment began because I stood up to him and he didn't like it. So he didn't play you then, did he? Do you think that Landry... Kind of, it sounds like he set you up a little bit by asking you that question. How do you feel about that? Not really wanting you to give a honest, truthful answer, more of just seeing if you were going to say, yes, sir, all is well, right. whatever you say, coach. Do you feel like he set you up almost in, in terms of, hey, I'm going to know if this guy is going to either be one of the soldiers, or he is going to, in his mind, I'm not saying that's where you were, be a problem. Yeah. Another part of not playing against San Francisco, they eventually put me out there. I had hurt my ankle in the first half of the St. Louis game from guys piling on, like when I was in high school. That's guys cool. piled on, it was over, I sprained my ankle, I limped to the sideline, they sprayed it with that cold spray stuff retake my ankle and then take my shoe on and at the end of the game is when I had the 40 something yard 48 47 yard kickoff return I didn't practice the whole week the next week because my ankle was swollen so bad I was on crutches I didn't even think I would go to the San Francisco game which was in San Francisco because I was on crutches but that day of the game, they came to my room, knocked on the door and said, wait, we want you to go down and eat breakfast in the hotel restaurant. And then we have a limo out front that'll take you to the stadium. We played the second game of a doubleheader. And I'm like, wow, well, I got to go to the stadium in the morning. So I go to the stadium and I train the team doctor and everything. And they wanted to shoot my ankle with Novocaine so I could play. And I said, no. And it was crazy because I was surrounded by Landry, Reeves, Mike Ditka, Gene Stallings, the two trainers, the team physician, J. Pat Evans, and Dr. Knight. And Dr. Knight slapped me on the leg and he says, Wait, how's that ankle feeling? I said, Doc, I think I can start trying to walk on it without the crutches, but it hurts. And he says, Oh, the reason why it hurts is because. The reason why you won't walk or run on it is because it hurts. He says, well, we're going to shoot a little medicine in that thing today, and you can play. And I literally looked at Landry and all the coaches and came back to coach to the doctor, Dr. Marvin Knight, and I said, I played dumb a little bit. I leaned back on my elbows, and I said, so you want to shoot some Novocaine in my ankle like when they deaden your teeth when you go to the dentist? And he says, yeah, exactly. I said, no, I can't let you do that. Whoa. Landry reached over him, pulled him back from the table calmly. And he got in between my legs and in my face, kept that calm demeanor. And he says, are you not going to do what the team physician tells you to do, young man? And I said, goes Landry. I can miss today's game and play the next 14. I'm not going to go out and play. 
with an ankle that I can't feel because I can tear it up and not even know it because it's dead. Holy. Play for the rest of my life. And he backed away, looked at me with this face, and turned and walked away. Dan Reeves surprised me by even trading for me to come to Denver because he called me a name and walked out. Dicka called me the P word and walked out. My Dang. DB coach, Gene Stallings, was the only one that was nice. And he said, wait. Let me know what you're going to do because I could really use you today. I didn't believe him, and this is why. The opening kickoff the week before against St. Louis, our second-round draft pick, Aaron Mitchell, defensive back, out of the University of Las Vegas, got knocked out unconscious on the opening kickoff. And I was his backup. So I should have been coming in on third down as the nickel back or the dime. They woke him up. He didn't know his name. He didn't know where he was. He didn't even know he was playing football. And our third down linebacker, Guy Brown, would hold his hand and take him in the game and line him up to who he was supposed to cover and just told him, follow that guy everywhere he goes. So if they put me on the field, when I was totally healthy, I hadn't sprained my ankle yet because the game just started. He wasn't going to use me against San Francisco, but at least he was trying. So I had them give me Tylenol with codeine. I had them give me contrast. So they iced it, and then I put it in a hot tub, whirlpool, and ice, whirlpool ice, see if we could get some of that stuff. The Tylenol with codeine did help with the pain or the sensation of pain. They taped it, and I began to walk without the crutches. And I went out and walked around the stadium feet. That candlestick was, was a garbage field. Walked around. I got to the point where I could find a job. Then two, three hours later, I could just stride had no explosion whatsoever. And I made the decision, okay, I'm going to play. Well, I went out for the opening kickoff, and I was praying, kick it to Ron Springs, because we had a tandem back there. And they did. And I figured they kicked it to Ron's side because they had three game films on me, the Houston game, the Pittsburgh game, and then the St. Louis game, and they were like, do not kick the ball to this guy. But they didn't. Every time, and we won that day. We beat them pretty bad, but every time they kicked off, they kicked the ball to Ron. Late in the game, game's almost over. They send me out for a punt return. I don't know why. We don't need it. But they send me out there, and I'm standing by second base in this dirt. It was very windy that day, and it blew all the topsoil off, and the infield was like slate rock. It was windy that day, and the wind just calmed down like there was no wind at all. Because I figured if it stayed windy, it's just going to be a fair catch, and I can jog off of there and be done with it. No, the wind totally went away, and I had to catch this ball and try to run with it. Well, I'm on the infield. I don't want to plant on my ankle. So I try to switch to the opposite leg to go. And the infield dirt just broke. And it jerked my leg. I tore my cartilage. Now I got a swollen ankle on one side, torn cartilage on the other. I get to the sideline and my knee is just clicking and clunking, click with every step, clunk. And I get over there, and in the moment, doctors are real truthful in the moment. Okay. So they got me on the sideline and they got my knee bent and they're checking it and maneuvering it. And Dr. Knight turns to Don Cochran, who was our trainer, and said, Man, he tore his cartilage, medial cartilage on the posterior horn. 
And then he looks back at me and he goes, you'll be all right. <laughs> the game ended. My knee is swollen as big as my ankle now. The next week, I get a, they didn't do MRIs then. They did what they called an orthogram. Dr. Knight goes, oh, those are just pictures. It doesn't mean that he has a tear. So I went to another doctor, and she says, yeah, Wade, you have a torn cartilage. He says, but I know a doctor that does arthroscopy, and arthroscopy was new then. He says, I'm going to send you to see Dr. Gunn. And he'll be able to scope this thing, and you'll be able to play next week. So I went to see him. So I go see him. He checks my knee out, and he says, Wade, you do have a torn cartilage on your posterior horn. He says, I can fix it today. We'll scope it, clean it up. I'll leave the majority of your cartilage. I want to get that tear out because it's going to keep flipping into your joint space. And causing your knee to swell, he said, "Didn't get that." And then he had this peculiar look on his face and said, "You don't know who I am, do you?" I said, "Yeah, Doctor Gunn." He says, "No, I used to be the orthopedic physician for the Cowboys, and I testified in court against them in a case with Pettis Norman, where he had a back knee." And they kept shooting him with cortisone, and cortisone speeds up the degeneration of cartilage and bone. And by the time he made it through his seventh or eighth season, they traded him to another team, and the other team wanted to know when did he have his cartilage removed from his knee because he didn't have none in there. And Pettis Norman never had surgery on this knee, but they kept giving me cortisone. So when Dr. Gunn testified in court against the Cowboys, of course, they fired him and wouldn't let him be the orthopedic doctor anymore. And I had gone to see him, and he said, as soon as they find out that you came to see me, your days are numbered in Dallas now. I said, man, I'm to get my knee healthy so I can play. And they keep telling me, they said I had a torn cartilage, but ever since then, I don't have one. And now you say I have one, Dr. Gunn, Dr. Jackson says I have one. What the hell is going on? He says, wait, they just want to see if you can play with injury. If you went outside of the team position back then, they could nullify your contract, (laughs) cut you and put you on waivers. So they threatened me. Because you went outside the Dallas Cowboy organization to get looked at, we can cut you. I had just got married, had a child, and I'm like, oh, man. So they signed me up for surgery in Munster, Texas. That's where Dr. Knight did his surgeries. I didn't go because I didn't want to be cut on. If this guy could put a scope inside my knee and pick it out, why would I want this Eight inch scar on my knee and missed the rest of the season. And I'm no, I'm not doing that. And then they threatened me again. So I went and I got the surgery. <sighs> to Dr. Credit, he said I'd never have a problem with this knee again. And I haven't had one minute's problem when he removed my cartilage. But my other knee, whoo, it's in bad shape. Um, but I didn't want to go through that surgery. I had never had a knee injury before, and I certainly didn't want to get cut off. Now, I want to fast forward because I know that you're the head of the Denver Broncos alumni chapter. Give us just one piece of advice that you give those guys when they retire. So as the president, as a former player and a football fan, I never stopped being a football fan. Fan. And once I found out how players were getting treated, not the ones that you see on TV that were really successful, made a lot of money like the John Elways and all of that, just regular old running the mill guy, because you ain't in the league very long. The average uh, career is 3.24 years. That ain't a long time. And you it gets right. dated 
you have a player like an Elway that played 16 seasons or Craig Morton that played 18 seasons, especially Tom Brady. He's blowing the top off of this thing. No, the average guy is playing one or two years and they're gone. It's a turnover league. But you leave, no matter how long you play, with the same injuries of guys that play 10, 12, 14. You have no care. And so that's what literally all the striking is about when these collective bargaining agreements end. We're trying to get better benefits for former players. And it's hard. I always use that little bit of fame or whatever it is to appeal to the business community. And so I was always able to get, when we had our meeting, a restaurant to pay for it. Mm. players and their wives, significant others, because they, they feel used. They didn't make a lot of money, but they were always told, give back to your community. You have to give back. You were a professional athlete. Like, well, I am broke. I can't give back. All I can give is my time. I don't have these millions of dollars to start mm. my own foundation and support. This Robert Newhouse yeah. told me he was for two draft picked by the Cowboys and he signed for $12,000. And everybody knows number 44 and number 33 and number 12. These guys didn't make a lot of money. Roger Starbuck's biggest payday was $250,000 his last year, which was my rookie year. He made all his money with the Tandy company and his real estate business. So anyway, I players that have to reach in their pocket to try to pay for meals, buy drinks. You can't bring your wife because this is a guy thing. No, we got guys now that they have brain issues. They got cognitive decline. They ain't going anywhere without their wife or significant other, especially at night, because these guys get lost driving they don't know where they are it's that bad so my goal was to take care of guys and i got involved with the league and we developed the cardiovascular risk assessment program so every player in the league now because of what we did here in in denver and that thing spread and went all the way to the national football league with goodell and then we now have a cardiovascular risk assessment program that's all over the country. Former players can come in and get assessed for different things. And I was a part of it. And I'm, I just thank God that I was a part of pushing this thing to where players have more benefits. And being a part of the NFL Players Association, which is our union, I was able on the side to help push for more benefits. So now we do have a joint replacement program where if guys need a joint, if they don't have insurance, the league will just take care of all of it. If you have insurance, they'll use whatever portion of your insurance will pay, and then they'll pay for the rest. So That's great. You know, That's some serious work that you're doing there, Wade, because I don't think that the general public understands or that the general fan understands these types of dilemmas. We see it on the field now. We were protecting the quarterbacks more. We were protect receivers going across the middle. And we see that. But we don't see is this behind the scenes, the alumni, the guys that are retired. Because like you had mentioned, some of these guys are in their late 20s. They only played a couple of years. Some are lucky and in their mid 30s. But regardless, they all have injuries and health issues that, yeah. that need to be addressed and looked at in terms of how do we help these guys because they are you guys are the gladiators of the world we all enjoy it it's entertainment but we don't want it where we just throw those gladiators away to the side just leave them to die after they've given us everything and so i really appreciate your work with that I think it's amazing stuff. Um, to wrap it up here, I want you, I'm just going to ask you this one thing and I want you to fill in the blank. So fill in the blank. Wade Manning is blank. A teacher. <laughs> I am a, a teacher. teacher whether in room or just in everyday life. I'm always trying to educate people, especially about how they should be eating. That's going to help 
their health, how they should be exercising, which is going to help their health. The different types of supplements that are available now is pretty amazing that will help you with your health. And since we have so much processed food and you're not getting the vitamins and minerals and antioxidants that you need, so I probably will be teaching for the rest of my life. And I've run into numbers of former students of mine from the high school level, and they will tell me, hey, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be eating like this now. I wouldn't be exercising mm-hmm. like this. And I'm going, wow, Lord, you put me in the right place. Yeah, I think that's true. Wait. Thank you so much for sharing our story and shedding some light on some of the underbelly of the game. And I feel like if you're able to evangelize that message to the general public so that we all better understand really the reality of life after fame, I think Mm -hmm. you would have an upswell of support. We hope that this show does that. Part of our intent is to shine a light on that so that people have a better understanding that, hey, man. We're ordinary dudes just trying to live life. And uh, they are thrown away when the lights uh, turned off. So thanks for being a part of that. And thanks for being a part of the show and really articulating in a way that I, we've never experienced here to understand some of those things. And your story is quite amazing. And thanks for taking the time out to uh, talk to us today. Yeah. We'd love to yeah. have you again well, sometime down the road, Wade. Thank you for being on. Hey, and that wraps up our incredible interview with Wade Manning, former NFL pro player for the Denver Broncos and Dallas Cowboys. What an extraordinary journey he shared with us, defying the odds and making his mark in the NFL as an undrafted free agent. Wade's story is a testament to perseverance and the power of believing in oneself. We've delved into his experiences playing for the renowned Dallas Cowboys franchise under the guidance of the legendary coach Tom Landry. Wade's transition from the NFL to becoming a high school educator was seamless, driven by his passion for teaching and making a difference in young lives. Today, Wade is not only an educator, but also the president of the Denver Broncos alumni chapter, imparting his wisdom and experiences to the next generation of athletes. His dedication to teaching and his genuine love for shaping lives is truly inspiring. We also want to express our heartfelt gratitude to the Life After Fame community for your continued support and for joining us on this exciting journey. Your presence and engagement mean the world to us, and we appreciate each and every one of you. Remember, this podcast is here to entertain, educate, inspire, and foster a sense of connection within our community. We are all in this together as fellow human beings, sharing experiences and stories. If you haven't already, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode. Visit us at lifeafterfamenow.com or find us on any podcast platform to catch up on previous episodes and stay updated on the latest releases. Join us next Tuesday for another captivating interview as we sit down with Jed Roberts, a former Canadian football player who overcame the challenges of being hearing impaired to achieve greatness on the field. You won't want to miss his remarkable story. On behalf of our guest, Wade Manning, I'm Joe Mastriona, along with my co-host, Joe Boglino. Signing off from the Life After Fame podcast, Wherever you are, have a fantastic day, and we look forward to connecting with you again next week.